All right, it's Friday. It's time for another mailbag edition of the Morning Pit here on youtube.com slash pantalaircom. Hope you're ready. We got some great questions coming in today. Hopefully won't uh, get too many thumbs up or balloons or fireworks or lasers. Maybe some lasers. I mean, because it's hard to uh, reject that one. Uh, but we've been having a lot of fun with those gestures this week. We'll try not to overdo it today, but I mean, I'm, I'm still kind of enjoying it. So I, I'm going to try and make it through this opening segment without any lasers or fireworks or uh, um, thumbs ups or, or the little hearts, which the hearts are really nice. Uh but it's fun to do. So I'm going to try really hard not to. Uh, but we'll see if we can pull it off. But we got some great questions this week. A lot of football stuff. A lot of, you know, targets and uh, leading receivers and questions like that. And, of course, the regular run of basketball and general sports stuff. So let's jump into it. Friday Mailbag here on Morning Pit. YouTube.com slash Pantalaircom. All right, lots of good questions as always. We actually have to start with some of the questions that we had from last week that we didn't get through all of the questions on last week's uh, Morning Pit Mailbag. So I mean, we have some good questions that came in this week, but we got to wrap it up from the previous week. So I want to jump into it uh, right away. No no, no need to uh, mess around or waste time. We'll just ask you to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That would always be great, youtube.com slash pantherlaircom. We'd appreciate it if you could uh, do that and check out the website panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. Smen just gets us started, though. Leftover question from last week. Best guess for usage and number of touches per game for Gavin Bartholomew in 2025? I mean, this is a million-dollar question here, and certainly I, I count me among the, the the hundreds or thousands who believe, um, you know, uh, that Bartholomew should get more touches, should get more opportunities. You look over usage of the past three seasons, 2021, when he was a freshman, 29 targets. He caught 28 of them, which is a pretty remarkable uh, catch rate, uh, and scored four touchdowns. Um, and three, I had 326 receiving yards. Uh, you go forward to 2022, his targets increased by seven. He had 36 targets over 13 games. Um, 21 receptions. I just want to double check that he played all 13 games in 2022. Uh, I believe he did. 13. Yeah. Okay. Um, 36 targets, uh, in 13 games, 21 receptions. So his targets went up by seven. His receptions went down by seven and his, uh, touchdowns got cut in half from four down to two. And we talked a lot about why that might have happened. One of the biggest, you know, some of the bigger changes, uh, the fact that he lined up in line a lot more, uh, you know, according to Pro Football Focus in 2022, on his passing snaps, he was lined up in line 80% of the time, as opposed to 32% the previous year. Uh, he was lined up in the backfield primarily in 2021 and had a lot of success there. And, and that worked because you had Lucas Kroll who could kind of operate there as well. You fast forward to this past season, the inline percentage went down. He moved into the slot a lot more. Actually, he played 35% of his uh, passing snaps in the slot, which is you know more than double what he did either of the previous two seasons. Um, still lined up in line a lot. Still didn't find himself in the backfield a lot, but it wasn't really a role, I guess, that Frank Signetti wanted to use or did use. Uh, you know, it, the other interesting stat was the average depth of target, where and again, we've talked about some of these stats a lot. 2021, his freshman year, his average depth of target was 1.85 yards. No, no, it was 1.8 yards. So he was, you know, average depth of target, you know, less than two yards downfield. Um, 2022, it increased to eight yards. And then to this past season, his average depth of target was more than 11 yards. Now, he still ended up with more yards per route run his freshman year than he did either of the previous two years because last year his targets went down to a career low 27 remember 2021 he had 29 targets the next year 36 this past year 27 a career low 18 receptions and only one receiving touchdown i mean all of those numbers have to come up and and it's it's it, it, it's malpractice to have numbers that low it's malpractice for Gavin Bartholomew to play a full season and have fewer than 30 targets. I would contend it's malpractice for him to have fewer than three targets per game or even just three targets per game. I, I think he needs to, um, 
I, I mean, like at least four targets per game, I would say, for Gavin Bartholomew. I think is reasonable. I think there's going to be a higher volume of passing for Pitt this season. I, I think they're going to throw more passes than they did last year. Um, you know, I think in Cade Bell's offense, I think they're going to be more plays run to begin with. And I think they're, so I think they're, you're going to have more passing plays. And I think it needs to be four per game, at least four targets per game, um, if not five. Uh, I, I think that would be reasonable for a guy who really does stand out as one of your best offensive weapons, one of your best we- you know, passing game weapons, uh, one of your most proven passing game weapons. I, I think you've got to get him the ball. I don't know if he's going to be the leading receiver or lead the team in targets or anything like that, but uh, he's he's got to get the ball. Good things happen when Gavin Bartholomew gets the ball. And he, and he, didn't, have, he didn't get the ball very much last year, um, not nearly enough. And, and I think you saw what the results were. Um, here's a good question from Potter County native uh, last year that who leads pit football in touchdown receptions this season? I say last year, I meant last week. Uh, who leads pit football in touchdown receptions this season? Kanate Mumfield, Kenny Johnson, Gavin Bartholomew, or the field? Um, I don't think it would be the field. I, I think it'll be one of those three guys that you mentioned, Mumfield, Johnson or Bartholomew and my guess is it'll be Johnson or or Bartholomew I mean I think Mumfield will have some touchdown catches I think he's got a chance to be the leading receiver on the team I, I'm not sure if he'll end up as the leading receiver but I, I think he'll, he'll he has a chance and I think he'll be a top two receiver at worst maybe top three I think those three guys you mentioned I think Mumfield Johnson um, Bartholomew will be the the three leading receivers in some order um, as far as touchdowns though I see Kenny Johnson or, or maybe Gavin Bartholomew probably catching more I think those guys will be it'll be one of those guys um, which one I'm not sure but I, I would say not the field I would say you take one of those three guys and then flip a coin on Johnson versus Bartholomew uh Shea the Jet says, is this year as critical a year that Pitt has had in years? New staff coming off a bad season and unproven as to uh, on-field play. Loss of momentum from the ACC championship is head-shaking. Yeah, this is huge, a huge year. This is a huge year for uh, Pat Narduzzi. You know, I mean, this this is and, – and I think people want to extend – I'll say this real quick. I think people look at this season and say Pitt's got to do well this year because of all the changes in college football. And there's some truth to that in that I think like if you do well this year, you're going to have a better chance of getting good players to help you do well next year. I don't know that necessarily anybody's making their decision on who they want to invite to the conference, um, you know, based on your most recent season's record. Somebody was like, oh, it was a terrible time to go three and nine. Uh, that That's going to hurt them with the big 12 or something. Well, I don't, I don't think it's any decisions are being made based on that. There be, the, the decisions are being made based on who can make you the most money. And so, yeah, your viewership numbers might be tied somewhat to your uh, on-field success and on-court success, but I, I don't think there's a big deal there. The big deal is as it relates to the future of the program and the long-term future of the program and Pat Narduzzi's viability as the head coach of the program. If you have another 3-9 and nine season or 4-8, and eight, you have – legitimate real big questions you're going to have to answer about Pat Narduzzi and and his future with this program um and and I know a lot of people feel like you you already have those questions to ask in in the wake of a three and nine season uh, but this is absolutely huge and 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 it's it's on one hand it's tough to go into such a big season with so much uncertainty, you know, of, of a new coaching staff, unproven coaching staff and unproven quarterback and all these questions on, uh, you know, whatever. Um, but on, on the other hand, there is a feeling, I, I have a feeling at least of, well, what they were doing last year was an abject disaster, particularly the quarterback and the offensive coordinator. Those things are changed completely. I mean, like a 180 on both of those spots. And so in that way, the uncertainty is a good thing because it's it's far better to have this than to have, uh, you know, if you were going into this season looking at with, with Frank Signetti and Christian Bayer. I think, you know, at, at, I think you know what that group would, would have provided you. Um, at, at least there's a little bit of unknown with Cade Bell and Nate Yarnell, uh, unknown that may end up, you know, panning out and, and, and working out for Pitt. But, um it is a huge season. There's a whole lot riding on this year, and and there are some big questions for sure. Um, 
All right, uh, jumping up to this week's questions. Uh, Smenges again jumps right in, and I appreciate that because I like this question. It says, is there a wide receiver on this team that's likely to have a Maurice French type of season in the Cade Bell offense? Um, and if so, who's most likely to do it? So, I mean, I think when you talk about a Maurice French type of season, you're, you're talking about um, – like just a ton of targets you know what i mean tyler boyd 2015 maurice french 2000 what year was it i mean was it 16 no or 18 19 maybe it was when maurice french set the the record for receptions in a single season you know i i don't know if they're going to set any records this year um <laughs> but I, I think we, we always say you don't take too much out of the spring game, right? We always say you don't go to the spring. You don't look at the spring game and, and really base too much on it. Unless there's a guy making like amazing diving catches or amazing passes. You, you don't read too much into it. But it was notable to me that they really were feeding the ball to Kenny Johnson in the spring game. I mean, peppering him with the ball constantly. I think that was really interesting. And, and that was really notable to me. Um that they did that. And and I don't know if they were just trying to put on a show or whatever, but Kenny Johnson was a, a you know, saw more targets in that spring game than I can remember any pit receiver getting in a, a blue gold game in a long time. Um and and, and it, it certainly gave the vibe of this is going to be the featured guy and and he's going to get a lot of targets. Now, gun to my head, I would say Kanate Mumfield probably ends up with more receptions than Kenny Johnson, but at least in the spring game, it was pretty clear that they were trying to force the ball to him. Now, there's always the cynical side, given that we're in the transfer portal era, that says somebody had an understanding or a conversation or a thought of like, you know what? Let's make sure Kenny knows how much we love him. Let's make sure we get the ball to Kenny so much that he can't possibly have any questions about his role or his usage. Now, I have no idea. I mean, like, this is entire, this is total speculation and, and uh, maybe, maybe even uh, reckless speculation, reculation. Um. <laughs> yeah, double thumbs down on reculation. Um, reckless, reckless speculation that they were trying to feed the ball force the ball to Kenny Johnson in the spring game a thousand times just to make sure he had no thoughts of uh, transfer. Because look, I mean, schools were still trying to get Kenny Johnson after spring camp and during spring camp. Um, you know, that didn't end in December when they got him locked up with another uh, NIL deal. Uh, so it's it's speculation on my part, probably a bit rec reckless. I almost said reculation again. Um, but it's it's speculation on my part. Oh, come on trying to get the thumbs down there it is um but it, i mean like I, I don't think you can rule anything like that out in the portal era there, there were all, there were times like over the last like two years spring camp training camp particularly spring camp and we would talk to pat narduzzi about somebody we'd ask about one player and he would end up rattling off nice comments about every guy on the depth chart and, and, and like bring up guys out of nowhere be like well this guy and i'll tell you this guy is having a great camp and I'd be like, what? Where did that come from? What are you talking about? And and I'd always have that sort of sneaking thought, and it's a bit cynical, of I wonder if he's just trying to make sure everybody stays happy so they don't transfer. I, I mean, it's a real consideration you would have to have. I mean, like you, you know, the spring game, the last time you're going to kind of have like an organized team activity like that for a while. Uh, right in the heart of the spring portal window. If you have a star player or somebody you want to make sure you hold on to, if it's like a wide receiver or something, forcing him the ball 20 times is not the worst way to go about it. But I don't know if that's what they were trying to do, but they certainly got him the ball a lot. Uh, RM250RACR4 says uh, our defense is feast or famine sometimes and much of our corner play links directly to our defensive line play obviously the more time a quarterback has the harder it is on the cornerbacks i know corner is the spot where rylan gandy may be the only guy we think is penciled in to start and the defensive line is going to be very new million dollar question that is hard to answer but i will i, I will ask anyway do you think our d-line will provide enough pressure to allow our cornerbacks to succeed or vice versa i really believe this is a fulcrum that decides how good our defense will be 
you know, Pat Narduzzi is funny sometimes. Uh, like in the past, I, I I feel like if you ask him about how well his his corners are playing, he'll he'll start talking about how good the pressure has been. And sometimes you'll ask him about all the pressure they're getting, and he'll talk about how well the corners are holding up and, and forcing the quarterback to hold the ball and let the D line to get there. Uh, it it obviously all works in tandem. I mean, it all kind of comes together. Uh, you know, the the pressure up front, the 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 coverage on the back end. Uh, there, there are elements of, uh, I mean, it's it's very symbiotic, right? And then you even got the extra element last year of teams not fearing Pitt's offense, so they were willing to try and push it with the run game more. And, and I, I did, I never ended up writing anything about this, and I'd have to find the stats that I'd written down. It was a significantly higher percent. Like, if you looked at rushing attempts, you know, out of total plays, you tried to find like a percentage of plays that were runs and you took out, just took out the sacks. I mean, it's hard to figure out with the scrambles and things like that, but just taking out sacks. So non-sack rushing attempts, um, 2022 versus 2023, 2021 versus 2023 and so on and so forth. It was a significantly higher percentage last year than it had been in previous seasons. Now were teams running more because they found they were having more success on Pitt's defense, probably a little bit, were teams running more because they were not afraid of Pitt's offense, so they felt like they could, uh, you know, Narduzzi said even they, teams would be behind and they would still be handing the ball off because they weren't worried that Pitt's offense was really going to stretch the lead. And if the other team was ahead, even by a touchdown, they weren't worried about Pitt's offense catching up. And I always thought that was an interesting angle, and I think it's something certainly worth considering when you look at the pass rush or the lack of effectiveness of the pass rush last year, of how how... They weren't getting home as much as they had gotten home before. Maybe there were fewer opportunities, and I think the numbers do kind of bear that out. You have a higher percentage of non-sack rushing plays um, than you had in previous years. Yeah, I mean, there's there, there's a volume question there. There's an opportunity question. And so it all kind of works in tandem. If So this is a long way around of saying, like, yeah, if the defensive line gets pressure, the corners are going to be able to have an easier job. If the corners ha- hold up better back there, you know, if Gandy and Rashad Battle or Tamon Lynham or Noah Bigelow or Tamarian Crumpley or whoever steps into one of those jobs, Jeremiah Anglin, it doesn't matter. If those guys hold up better on the back end, there's going to be better opportunity or more time for the D-line to get home with the pass rush. And if Pitt's offense is able to produce at a higher level, and, and keep a little bit of pressure on the opponents. They're going to run the ball less and create more opportunity for the, the pass rush and the pass coverage to make plays. So there are a lot of factors that go into it. You're asking uh, your question, do I think the D-line will provide enough pressure to allow the cornerbacks to succeed um, or vice versa? I mean, like that, I think you hit it with the vice versa because they need the D-line to create pressure, but they need the corners to hold up in coverage, right? So do I think they're going to get enough of what they need from both of those elements i i don't know <laughs> i just gave it like the longest answer to ultimately say i don't know um 121 rum wants to know the favorite song i've ever seen performed live holy cow how could i even think about a question like that i mean i read the question earlier so i've been thinking about it a little bit And I can't think of one individual performance of a song. I mean, like there, there, there've been, it's like so much of it is, is in the moment. You know, I was at a, a, a festival last spring in Charleston, South Carolina and Wilco played and they played a song that was just the perfect song for that moment. You know, um, when we went to, you know, went to see Roger Waters do the wall 12 years ago, you know, and some of the songs were just exactly perfect at that moment you know um except for comfortably comfortably numb because he walked around pantomiming the the chorus it was very weird your lips move like this it was the strangest thing um so i mean it's all about like in that moment and, and that moment can be defined by so many things of like the, the company the weather i went to some shows at star lake last summer and it was just a perfect weather and i was with good friends people i hadn't seen since college and things like that and like well, that enhances the experience. That changes the experience. So when a song was played, if a good song was played in that exact moment, you say, this is perfect. You know, and, and you see enough concerts, you, you hope you can have at least one of those experiences at every concert. And if you're lucky, you'll get a few of them. Um, that's really hard for me to narrow down. I would have to think a long time about what the, the best 
performance I've ever seen of a single song. Uh, I want to get, let's get one more here. Um, all right. SV pig one says, how do you uh, assess the talent on offense versus defense? I feel like there are legitimate weapons on offense. Uh, Bartholomew's elite. Rodney Hammond's good. Mumfield is a strong number two. The O line if healthy looks okay. Perception that the O is bad because of last year's results, but you can make a case that it's more talented than the defense. Um, what are your thoughts? I, you know, like, I, obviously I think there are holes on both sides. Uh, I, I think you're right that Kanate Mumfield is like a legit number two receiver, but there's still that big hole of a legit number one wide receiver. And you still have like Kenny Johnson, no matter how high the expectations are for him, there's very little to base those on. There's like a big kickoff return and, and, and hype, you know? Um, and so like that, remains to be seen Dejon Reynolds played made some nice plays last year but I, I don't see him being the number one I don't know if you count on either of the Western Carolina guys to be the number one. you know it's I, I think that's a big hole you know and and you can say like oh there's good talent you know Kanate Mumfield's a really good number two receiver he is but you still need that number one you can say the O-line should be good if it's healthy they should but you still need depth um Nate Yarnell for all I talked about him two days ago and all those stats and everything you still He's still got to do it. I, I think there are more proven commodities on defense. Nah, I shouldn't say proven commodities because some of it is hype and expectation and, and projection. Um, I, I think on defense, you, you have a proven, you have proven commodities at safety. Um, and that might be about the extent of it. Uh, but I think if you look at safety and linebacker, they both should be really good. You know, I, I think those positions should both be uh, really good. And that that's five out of the 11 spots. I'm not sure I would find five spots on offense where I should, where I would say those spots, they should be really good. You know, not, not to the level that I think the safeties and the linebackers are going to be. And so I do give the edge talent wise to, to the defense um, in that regard, but both sides have a lot of questions to answer. Both sides have holes to fill and both sides have, have some real questions that they've got to uh, figure out and, and they're going to have to prove on the field so it's a uh it's tough there, there's just so many unknowns and then we'll keep talking about this team and the unknowns all through the uh all through the summer and all through the rest of the off season. but the unknowns are out there and it's tough to uh make make real judgments on who the team is or what they'll be um, until some of those unknowns become a little more known for better or worse um, till they become a little more known. But thanks for all the questions uh, today. I really appreciate everybody who who posted questions. You remember, if you want to be part of the mailbag, go to the Between Fifth and Forbes message board at pantherlair.com, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com to get, uh, and you can obviously get all the pit sports coverage there as well. You can be part of the mailbag. You can get all the pit coverage. It's the best place to go for uh, pit conversation, the best online community of pit fans you're going to find. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash pantalaircom, so you don't miss any of our pit video content. We keep coming up with things to talk about, and so uh, I appreciate everybody who tunes in. Thanks for watching all week, really. Um, we appreciate that for sure. Thanks for uh, tuning in today. I hope you have a great Friday and a great weekend, and we will catch up with you on Monday on the morning pit, youtube.com slash pantalaircom.